these are all the zone A plants. So when we sort of break and we're going to try to figure out, maybe assign two or three people to a couple of these uh, rain gardens, here's our pile of plants. We'll be bringing the plants that the design calls for over to the rain garden, positioning them, and uh, once all of the larger plants are placed as you feel it, it's reflected in the design, then come get me, I'll come over, I'll take a look, I'll say, okay, it looks great, or make any adjustments if the adjustments need to be made, and then we'll plant the bigger ones. Once we plant the bigger ones, then there are some smaller zone A plants. We'll do the same thing, we'll position them, and then I'll take a look, and if it's good to go, then we'll plant them. So we're kind of doing this position first, then plant, okay? And then, I don't think we'll get to it today, the zone B will probably be more of a tomorrow thing, but just keep in mind, as what I was describing about the delineation between zone A and zone B, based on how it was actually built, because it's not always built exactly the way that it's planned. A couple notes on planting. Uh, since this soil is so fluffy, we don't have to dig a really large area. Typically, if you're dealing with hard soil that really hasn't been disturbed recently, you want to dig at least one and a half times larger than the pot so that the roots have an opportunity to grow into soil a little bit easier. This stuff's really fluffy, we don't need to do that. We just need to dig a hole as big as the pot, maybe if only slightly bigger because some soil might slide back into the bottom. So you're going to um, dig a hole slightly larger than the plant pot, so that's reflected here. Uh, and then once uh, you take the plant out of the pot, Sometimes a plant, uh, depending on how long these have been potted, the roots will be Hi, I'm Lindsley Rollins for Earth Village, and I'm interviewing Pandora Patterson, the founder of Earth Village who is uh, here at Veterans Village, a, uh, an incipient neighborhood for homeless veterans in Clackamas County. Um, so, tell me about it. Well, um, I first got involved with this project through my urban permaculture design class, and uh, we all were assigned a test project and you took this class at PSU? No, there's another, um, there's another class that also worked on the design that's a class of PSU students. Mm -hmm. But I worked on it through city repair or planet repair. They have a permaculture design course that they do every year. And it's urban permaculture. So we did a lot of uh, urban type projects um, and the Veterans Village, they wanted to incorporate some of the permaculture pr principles in that. So they had different classes put in different ideas for the design of it. Nice. So they had a input from many places to put this together. They did. They had architects yeah. mm -hmm. and uh, gather they had the Pickathon supplying building materials after they tore down their pickathon stages. Right, yeah, so the, the actual building design was done by um, a group of architects to kind of promote the project, but there were a couple of different alternative building designs. Uh, one we'll show later is um, designed by the PSU students. And then my design team with the permaculture class, we designed our own building so it's kind of neat to see these different design options and how the functionality would be for the different vet veterans that might be living here it's so what I'm seeing here it looks as if the gutters go down underneath and come out into the swales. yeah they so go into the swales that way yeah yeah maybe so they, maybe the county wanted the flood control they did yeah right. no um, I just did uh, my design team actually did we ended up with three designs so we wanted to do a couple of fun designs just to kind of stretch the limits of what we could do in the class and have a little bit of fun with it. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, the rainwater was going to go above ground where you could see it mm -hmm. um, as little kind of river paths. But um, yeah, we, the, they ended up doing 
something that was a lot more functional. Um, and I think it's going to work out nicely because you kind of want to keep it simple for the Slow new people maintenance. that are, yeah, the new people are going to be moving in. I think there's 15 veterans going to move in in two days from now. Hmm. I wonder if they're going to plant trees to screen out the industrial views. That's a good question. We didn't um, we didn't get a whole lot of budget for the trees. Um, I noticed they do have some vine maples, so those would be kind of pretty. And I don't know if we'll end up planting those along the edges or um, if they'll go in the center. Uh, some people on the committee city repair meeting the other day said they thought some of the trees should go in in the center here but we do have the light poles in the center too so i'm not sure how those vining maples would do do in there um they just went and picked up the plants a couple days ago so we didn't really know what we'd get i had a whole species list but we weren't really able to go exactly by that we had to just get what we could get at pick up at the last minute. Do you know what they did get? Or I guess we'll did. find out later. I, I did take a peek oh. over there. Um, so there are the vine maples, there's some Oregon grape. Um, let's see, there's Kinnikinnak, there's some wild strawberries. Um, Kinnikinnak, what is that? It's a little uh, kind of ground cover with little round leaves. Um, let's see. What oh, else? you mean bearberry? I'm not sure if that there it's could low be, and it has little round berries and it spreads. It could there cover. could be a lot of different names for for the different common names or mm -hmm. yeah the common names we should be using the scientific names. That's all right. Uh, let's see what else did we have? Oh, there was some there was some bulrush and some other rushes so that we could put, in the swale. Yeah, put in the swale the the water type plants. Yeah, there might be a couple other things that I nice that will come across later that I didn't notice. They could use a berm over there. They've got a bit of a berm. I'm not sure if that's intentional over there or if that's just a pile of bark chips. But in fact, if they could mound the earth and then plant things along the top of it, you would not know that there was a factory there and a Huge yeah, it's a cement, block a cement and, plant that's next yeah. door. Yeah, so that does look nice that that covers up the fence. Mm -hmm. What that what that actually is is they had landscapers come and drop off wood chips here, just mounds and mounds of wood chips. So it's and, mount wood chip. Yeah, and af after they spread out all the wood chips, they had that many left over, which these will break down, and then they'll be putting these out here again to kind of renew it. They'll mm. use them all up. But if I lived here, I would invite people to come and dump their excess dirt. If they excavate a basement, we've got a place to put your dirt. Let's just make ourselves a little berm. You know, give us That's a little three-dimensionality to the kind of a landscape. Happy yeah, um, it would be beneficial to all concerned. Right. Yeah, because we had thought about putting plants around, you know, the perimeter, but. That berm idea is pretty. pretty if you have neat. a berm, you don't need as many plants. <laughs> yeah, and you have a little green hill. And then down on this side, there it goes actually down the cliff. So a cliff. Yeah. So really? we're actually on top of the berm over here. So it goes down, and there's actually a river down there. Score. Well, no wonder there is not a cement plant on our left. Yes. <laughs> no. That makes sense. But nice. if, if you look down from above at Google Maps, you'll see where the cement uh, contractors dug in and there's like these basins of water where they've you excavated out the, the products that they need to make cement. Uh -huh. Cement, yeah. They're Here? not natural. Yeah, over, hmm. over in that section, um, they're not natural ponds, they're <laughs> excavations. Todd Ferry of PSU, so tell me what's going on here. Okay, so um, we are at the Clackamas Veterans Village, and I am from Portland State University with the Center for Public Interest Design, and we were part
part of uh, creating the POD initiative, which resulted in the Kent Women's Village. And uh, that was kind of bringing together houseless folks and advocates and activists um, uh, and with architects all together to talk about uh, what might uh, the village model look like and how can we advance that. And so uh, for the Kenton Village, 14 teams formed, uh, designed pods, and uh, Kenton was opened in under a year uh, from the start of that project. One of those pods uh, was called the Safe Pod, and it was designed by SRG, which became the prototype for the pods that you see behind you here at the Clackamas Veterans Village. And what's been great about uh, the partnership with PSU and others is that uh, faculty and students at the School of Architecture utilized an annual process they do by designing and building a temporary stage at Pickathon. Uh, they, they choose a material that will be reused and taken out of the waste stream and then they uh, and then it's applied and for the first time they thought about it in terms of how can it be used for social good and so in this case the module they used was the truss and so these pods that were designed uh, have trusses for both the wall and the roof so each each pod I think has around 21 trusses and so uh, they made a stage out of 700 trusses and so they used the process of creating the stage in order to create the trusses that then uh, were donated to the Clackamas Veterans Village. What you're seeing behind you is 15 pods. Uh, this village can accommodate 30 pods and so this, these are the first 15. Uh, when we were thinking about and conceiving of the village, we, our hope was that uh, maybe the residents of the village can both figuratively, figuratively and literally um, build their own village. So hopefully they'll be involved in the next, creating the next 15. So my, my students and I worked on a pod that was informed by uh, the residents of the Kent Women's Village and Hazelnut Grove and other villages around uh, the Portland area and came up with a prototype pod that we think uh, could potentially be be one that's built uh, for the next 15. And it's, it's over here, it's, it's on site to kind of serve as, a, as an example to build from or learn from as the residents and the village operators would like to. So the uh, site plan was really done, uh, was led by Communitecture and uh, the Center for Public Interest Design, who I work with, um, worked closely with them on that. And there was uh, a lot of uh, logistical issues in terms of figuring out how to maximize space and um, make it as welcoming as possible. But one thing that I think is interesting about the layout is that some of it was informed by the thesis work of a PSU architecture student named Sean Newberry and she was looking at uh, how veterans returning from uh, from war uh, might uh, might be reintegrated into housing and what that housing might look like and so uh, what she found was that smaller clusters were ideal uh, they could be inward looking because these are often people who go from uh, l from larger groups to smaller groups such as a battalion, platoon, company to squad, and so uh, really that same kind of uh, thinking informed the layout of the the kind of squad up to up to company. So smaller communities toward larger communities. And there's perhaps a feeling of security from having neighbors. That's right. And so the the pods are inward looking, so everyone is uh, can kind of help keep an eye on uh, on each other and be part of a community. And today you're going to be planting the landscape. Yep, today we'll be planting the landscape. The landscape, as I understand it, was really uh, developed by City Repair uh, in conjunction with Communitecture and they figured out how to utilize the drainage and bioswales in order to uh, really accommodate uh, accommodate plantings around the whole site. And this is compact, but it'll do for one person. It's a lot bigger than my tent. A little ceiling light. Electricity going here. They have supplied blankets and pillows and a sleeping bag and a welcome mat. And the bed is long enough Probably up to about five ten. If you're <laughs> six foot five, like my husband, you might have to bend your knees, but that's okay. And um, I noticed because they built these from trusses that were given to them from Pickathon, um, it looks like they're going to put a little shelf here, or maybe a bench, 
but again it gives you a little more lean back room and there is a closet rod here and I notice that this inset gives room for the shoulder of your clothes. They don't have to hang this thing in too far into the room and take up your floor space. So that's a that's an economy. They'll probably hang things from the rafters. <laughs> So Matt, Bebo, yes. you are with City Repair yes. doing the landscaping part. How is that, how is your organization affiliated with this homelessness relief project? Sure, so uh, City Repair as an organization has been supporting uh, homeless villages in Portland for close to 20 years. Dignity Village was one of the first ones in a national model. Um, our, and what did they do there? Uh, Dignity Village uh, was a and is a homeless village that was really built by the community. Uh, the city provided a piece of land for the village to reside on, and um, it's one of the most sourced, I think, examples of this kind of housing solution. I just call it a temporary housing solution uh, for homeless individuals. And um, in the last five years, there have been a lot more projects coming up in the area, some supported by the city and municipality and some that are a little bit more rogue. And this one is obviously an example of one that uh, is strongly supported by Clackamas County and uh, has a significant amount of infrastructure that reflects that support. So city repair, uh, as it relates to this particular project, was one of a long list of partners which include a lot of um, architects and other groups that uh, found a way to support this project moving forward. So uh, I know that Mark Lakeman and his design firm Communitecture uh, built one of, uh, I think it was maybe a different village, but they've been involved in the design and building of some of the pods. Uh, City Repair has supported some of the organization around getting volunteers to come here and uh, helping share information and generate support for this kind of project. So and, yeah. whose idea was it originally? Was it that the county wanted to do this or did someone propose it to Clackamas County? Honestly, I'm not sure where the idea came from. Uh, it seems like at some critical juncture it received significant county support. And I actually remember seeing a, a county newspaper for Clackamas County and there was a, a very large spread in that newspaper that listed every single one of the county commissioners with their photograph yeah. with a, a lengthy quote of their support for this project. So it's really awesome to see, uh, I think, partly the groundswell of support over the decades and years to get to the point where uh, cities and counties can really take a, a solid uh, effort at building something like this. This is, I think, to my knowledge, an unprecedented level of municipal support, so that's really cool. It's huge, and I was reading that they have about a hundred veteran homeless in Clackamas County and that they were hoping for this ultimately to house 30 mm -hmm. but they said they were hoping by next year to have all their um, military veteran homeless housed um, it's within a year and a half now I don't know if they're working on the other projects yet but that's a serious commitment of course that would still apparently leave them with about um, you know 2200 left to go of who aren't veterans, but that's yeah. huge. But this is huge. Yeah, and this is groundbreaking, like I said, in the support that it has from the county. In some places, it would be also city support. Uh, and there is a three year, I don't know what they technically call it, maybe a three year lease for this particular use. And it's a time where the functionality of this type of situation and its impact on the, the neighbors and the community and how much it actually costs and how well it works for the individuals that it's serving, uh, that's all going to be data that's collected to determine how successful it is and uh, how, how many more of these would be practical and, and would have enough support from the city county community to, to install. So, you know, it's my hope that this is a really successful uh, project. Of course, there will be changes and tweaks along the way, as is with anything. Sure. Um, but I really hope that uh, it, it serves as a good enough example that uh, it's one of many that, that end up going in, you know, across the state. And this is an issue that's not local to Portland and not uh, regional to the Northwest, but it's a, it's a problem everywhere. And so. Mm -hmm. Hopefully this will serve as an example. Now, I, where my, would you like me to speak to my specific role in, in today's, today's effort? Yeah, go for it. Sure. So I've actually been uh, 
hoping to get involved in this project for some time. It's been at the periphery. Some of my colleagues with City Repair and Community Texture have been working on this, and uh, I, I found out about it a little bit m in more detail when uh, the trusses, so the shapes of these structures, they use a repeating pattern. It's this mm -hmm. sort of long triangle shaped truss, and uh, those trusses were used to build a feature, a stage, at the Pickathon music event, I believe, two years ago. And so there was some information about it, and I knew that City Repair had some involvement, and Community Texture had some involvement. So um, I tend to be more of like a sort of plant garden person. One of my one of my roles and jobs is to do uh, install installations of ecological landscaping. And so when I was asked this week, would I be willing to lead a volunteer crew to plant these uh, rain gardens? I, I said absolutely. That sounds really good. And the way that I understand it is that. Uh, with any project like this, there are a lot of boxes that need to be checked off before there's approval for somebody to live on site. And one of the last boxes that needs to be checked off is the environmental box. And in order to do that, uh, these rain gardens need to be planted with the uh, plants that they were ecologically engineered to have. So and on the building plan, on the, on the plan, yeah. So <laughs> so I received some plans and uh, put in a large plant order, and uh, my colleagues and I. Uh, yeah, you put said out you a, had a lot of two thousand plants. I think there are about a little over two thousand two hundred plants that were spec for these six rain gardens, and so uh, it was sort of last minute, but everything came together really well. And uh, we have a class. Uh, Todd, who's an instructor at Portland State University, uh, has been involved in this project from the beginning in various uh, ways and he's brought his class out to help at various times and so his class is here today helping us plant and our goal is to get the plants in the ground as close to the plants as we can so that uh, when Monday comes around and Building the person comes and checks, it's all good. Uh, they, they like what they see and they can get their approval so the feds can move in on time. So yeah, I'm really happy to be involved and just love uh, the opportunity, not just to plant the plants, but also to take the opportunity to teach people a little bit about the plants mm -hmm. and planting and the function of a rain garden and how all these structures here, every structure on site drains into a rain garden. So uh, these larger right, to the structures swales. that uh, are more of the facility structures, um, they have larger rain gardens, and then these ones, you know, it's not a large surface area, so they, they are slightly smaller rain gardens, but each one has its own uh, planting pattern. And so we're just trying to get it as close as we can. So the strawberries will be on the upper surface? They're yeah. not good down in the underwater, right? That's right. So a lot of these plants that are left are going to be the zone B plants. They're the ones that can tolerate a little bit drier conditions. Mm -hmm. uh, the rain garden's designed to fill up with water and uh, not overflow, ideally, and over time, after the rain stops, it soaks in. And so above the high water mark, that's the zone B where it's a little bit drier and some of these remaining plants will go. So we have... Uh, Is that Salal? Yeah, we have Salal, we have Knicknick, we have Wild Strawberry. Now what's... Think, oh, the Knicknick, that's Bearberry. Um, yes. Yeah, I think that maybe is also right. a common name for it. And then I think uh, one of the, uh, maybe the sedge also goes on top. Yeah, so we're making actually really good progress today. I think by the end of the day we'll have all the Zone A planted, and tomorrow we can just focus on Zone B and clean up, and then hopefully everything goes well. Like Salal would be nice in front of the chain link fences. I know, yeah. There's a lot more that I think would be nice to have happen here in terms of the landscaping and planting, and this is obviously the one that they needed the most. So mm -hmm. Yeah, this is what you need for them. We're doing it, but I would better. imagine that uh, a later fall planting and an early spring planting and then like a late spring planting to, to kind of focus on some of the different areas. Like I would love for the, the living units here to have a little bit softer scaping around them, so a little bit more green, a little bit more That plant. would be nice. And uh, at the entrance, I'd love for there to be some more plants uh, since this is a three-year sort of trial for this, uh, they, they don't want too many trees to be planted. And so mm -hmm. things like that, we're trying to think creatively, like if we want to bring in some trees, maybe we can get permission to have like one fruit tree per unit so that the resident can be tending a tree as well as a small oh, that's garden. that's lovely. And a then, little miniature yeah, one, about little, little six, eight, dwarf ten fruit feet. Tree. Yeah, yeah, that could be easily moved in three years if we had mm -hmm. to. And then in the front, maybe some um, wine barrel planters. So mm -hmm. we could have some bigger things growing in them, but it could still be moved if need be. So those are nice. just some plans, yeah. Um, so last year, the one of the courses I teach in is a permaculture design course, and there was a group of students who focused their design project uh, on the site. So they did a planting plan, considering not just 
the ecological function, but also the edibility. So in permaculture, I we believe like to, Pandora was working. Yeah, Pandora was one of those uh, team members trying to balance the ecological and human uh, benefit of the the planting plan. And so I'm hoping that after we get through this very necessary phase of getting the rain gardens uh, taken care of, that we can look at some of the other places and be addressing you know, growing food on site, uh, having there be more perennial plants that are food providing, but also providing more ecological function and green this space up because it's a beautiful space and it's so amazing that these structures are here mm -hmm. and uh, it's basically like units and wood chips and path surfaces and I really like to see things get greened up and so there's a lot that we can do for the aesthetics, for screening from the surrounding industrial uses, mm -hmm. uh, aromatics, all kinds of uh, things that we can do to have this be a really great experience for the Some vets that are living finds, here maybe. and also it'll bring in nature and so there'll be just yeah. more birds and that's so lovely. That's yeah. It's it's great. Is that a cherry tree right there? I'm not sure. It could be. It might be a Dark native cherry. cherry. Anyway, good. Thank you very much. Yeah, my pleasure. So nice to meet you. Yeah, happy to be here and thanks for helping today. Appreciate it. Robert is a veteran who has come by to look at the place with some friends who says he's thinking about moving here maybe in three months or so. Right. And what changes for you in three months? Uh, getting uh, my disability and stuff, so I've got to uh, have something to start on. Hmm. Where are you staying now? I'm staying at the Do Good Shelter off of Sandy. Hmm. So what is it about this place that is attractive to you? Well, you've got your own little room. You ain't got to share with uh, 20 other people. Mm -hmm. That's true. And it looks like you've got a friend or two over there who might want to be moving right. in as well. So you would have the neighbor who you knew. I have a few of them. Would you pay rent here or would it be free as compared to the shelter? Does it, that make any difference to you? Uh, it doesn't make no difference. And how would you get from here to places? Would you walk to the store? I'm going to have to uh, walk up, catch the bus, go to the stores or whatever. So there's bus service nearby? Uh, yeah. Hmm. Nice. So would you have a disability cabin? Do you have difficulty walking? Or, or would one of these be fine for you? Oh, this would be fine. Hmm. I don't need a wheelchair ramp or anything like that. Have you picked out one of the no. sleeping pods that you would prefer? Uh, mainly no. one away from everybody. Is that right? Yeah, your friend says he wants number 30. Anyway, nice to meet you. Nice meeting you. Y'all have a nice day. Thank you. So it's Sunday, the day after mass planting, and almost all the plants are in. There are only a few left, but they've got in the ones that are necessary for the building inspector. inspector. Um, and you see they've got Oregon grapes starting to turn red for the fall, and strawberries. Uh, Kinnikinnik, which I know is bearberry, has a little red berry. I guess bears like them. What? doesn't a bear like after all. <laughs> I don't know. Little, little native the, roses. Yeah, that's the the nuke de rose and salal. So yeah, basically we just had to get the swales um, for the rainwater catchment uh, planted. And that's all we're doing today. So we will catch you next time on Earth Village.